Hey folks, Professor Finn, we're back. We're looking at Chapter 6, Embalming Chemicals. Let's go ahead and get started. Well, we are becoming more conscientious of our work environment and environmental sustainability in general. Going green and tree hugging is the wave of the future, so you better you know, open your arms and find the nearest plant and give it some love. Manufacture of chemicals are raising safety standards by newer and safer chemicals. Formaldehyde is still a potential carcinogen, okay? In a previous chapter, I believe it was chapter three, we saw that you know the rest of the world in 2014, I think it was, said, oh yeah, yeah, it's cancer causing, but the United States is like, no, no, it's not. You can't make us believe that. Um, newer formaldehyde-free preservatives effectively sanitize uh, whatever we're doing with them. However, they do not firm with a squat, okay? And that is one of the problems is that old school embalmers look for that firming to make sure things happen. Embalming chemicals are packaged in concentrated form, which means we need to dilute them if necessary. We can certainly go waterless. Um, we'll learn about waterless solutions. Don't you worry about that. But for the most part, we do dilute it down for you. Most chemicals are toxic and hazardous that we play with. So contact dermatitis, a skin rash as a result of skin exposure to the chemical, is quite common. And we don't want to get that, so make sure you're suiting up appropriately. And we discuss proper protective gear in Chapter 3. Chemicals typically used undiluted in our profession. Cavity fluid, okay, cavity preservative. Accessory chemicals, things that are not used in the embalming tank. Bleaching agents, solvents, osmotic gels, and powders. Six general chemical groups provide the basic components of our chemicals that we use. So we have preservatives. We have disinfectants or germicides. We have modifying agents, which modify the effect of the preservative, and generally these fall into the general category of supplemental chemicals, buffers, anticoagulants, surfactants, and humectants. So many of those modifying agents will be found in preservative solutions already, and what they have in there affects their name. So for instance, you might have uh, something like a high-index preservative that has a surfactant to increase penetrating power. So you would use that probably in a case um, where you need a high index and you need it to firm very quickly. So yeah, that would make sense. Um, if you needed to, to do something you know, a bit more neutral, a um, bit more pleasant, not as harsh, well, then you'd probably add a buffer to stabilize you know, the pH of the body as well as maybe a humectant to retain moisture. So these modifying agents can already come pre-mixed in the solutions, which is why you should read the label and read the marketing information and ask your chemical reps about these chemicals they're selling. You have dyes or coloring agents, which uh, come in cosmetic or non-cosmetic, okay? Active dyes versus non-active dyes. Perfuming agents uh, just make things smell better, and vehicles, okay? Vehicles, which basically um, dilute the concentrated chemicals, so water, uh, alcohol, methanol could be a, a vehicle, for instance, but generally we use water as our primary vehicle. Five of the six in the group are added to the concentrated embalming fluid to control the adverse effects of the main preservative chemical to maintain its stability and to strengthen its shelf life. So the first thing we're going to look at is the arterial side, the preservative stuff, arterial fluid, also known as embalming, vascular, or preservative fluids. It's the concentrated fluid that will be diluted to form the arterial solution for injection into the arterial system during vascular embalming. So arterial fluid, okay, you know I don't like covering definitions. This is how important this is. The arterial fluid, the vascular fluid, the preservative fluid, the embalming fluid is the concentrated stuff in the bottle before we add water to it. The arterial solution or embalming solution, primary dilution, is the fluid that is now mixed with the vehicle. Solution composed of the concentrated arterial fluid diluted with the water or additive chemicals for injection into the body. Cavity fluid, this needs no introduction. We can use cavity fluid for surface and hypodermic embalming. In supplementals, fluid injected for purposes other than preservation and disinfection. So notice that it goes in the tank. It's how you keep the accessory chemicals and the supplemental straight. Do I put it in a tank? If I put it in the tank and inject it, it's a supplemental. If it's an accessory, 
It's the group of chemicals used in addition to vascular and cavity fluids. So it doesn't go in the tank and it doesn't go through the trocar. It's typically your gels and powders. Just to make matters confusing, we have special purpose fluids, which are designed for special body conditions. Um, so things like high index um, decomposition fluid that's meant to firm very quickly, worst case scenario, that would be a special purpose fluid. Jaundice fluid intended to treat severe jaundice would be a special uh, purpose fluid. Early on, people actually sold the stuff already diluted, but when people you know, realized they could save money with, by taking the water out, they did. Um, formaldehyde reacts very harshly with body tissue, so by itself with nothing, none of those modifying agents we looked at, okay, it does not distribute or diffuse. It preserves very quickly. The stuff doesn't leave the vasculature for, you know, squat. Very, very brutal stuff. It darkens, dehydrates, and grays. It's disgusting. The old suggested standard, the rule of thumb, was one gallon of preservative solution for every 50 pounds of body weight at 2%. So the 2% has never changed. 2% hypotonic solution is what we're looking for. But an old way to determine that you put enough juice into the body is one gallon for every 50 pounds of body weight. That has modified some, okay? Each individual chemical component has its own specific function to form. And among the main chem chemicals common to almost all embalming preservative solutions is formaldehyde and methyl alcohol because formaldehyde is your preservative and your methyl alcohol stabilizes it so it doesn't decompose. Formaldehyde would break down and separate from its solution if it didn't have the alcohol to kind of keep it where it's at. Uh, all other chemicals in your preservatives vary immensely. And it is unlikely that two different brands of fluids will have a similar composition. So 120 in dilution from, say, Dodge Chemical Company may be very much different chemically from a 20 index solution that does the same exact thing from Pierce or uh, Champion or Frigid or whoever. There is no general standard on what constitutes a standard embalming fluid. It is important to perform a pre-embalming analysis to consider all factors in determining what you're going to use to create your arterial solution. So green or natural burial fluids are very temporary preservation, usually only three to five days. They're usually an alcohol base. There's no formaldehyde in it. They're biodegradable and they're typically non-toxic. Most do not have any tissue firmness. So if you're looking for the firming, it ain't going to happen. Composition includes oil ingredients derived from gums and resins of plants, including a variety of spices. They are antiseptic and they can precipitate and coagulate proteins. So preservative or fixative chemicals are the agents in the chemical preservative solution which react with protein. They change a protein from a state that easily reacts with water to one which does not. Formalin is the commercial source of formaldehyde and the most commonly used chemical in arterial solution and preservative solution formulations. Um, other preservatives, okay? Paraformaldehyde, formaldehyde, formaldehyde donors, light and other type of aldehydes, glyoxyl, phenol, phenolic derivatives, some alcohols. There are primary duties and secondary duties, which we're going to look at, okay? And some of these have a primary duty of something else. So like a glutaraldehyde, its primary duty is a disinfectant. It can be a preservative, but it's a better disinfectant. So formaldehyde. In 1859, it was discovered by Alexander Butleroff. Now, Wilhelm von Hoffmann conclusively identified it and found a reliable way to make it. Okay? And he did this by oxidizing menthol with air using metal as a catalyst. And this process is still used today. Formaldehyde naturally occurs everywhere and is essential to the working of the human body. It's also a known toxin that causes numerous ailments. Studies on its carcinogenic properties continue to be inconclusive because of so many factors that uh, fall into it. But like I said multiple times, the rest of the world seemed to figure out this was cancer causing. Uh, you, United States, simply cannot kind of wrap its mind around that. You know, your lobbying money's at work. It is a colorless gas at ambient temperature. So room temp, it's a gas, has a strong odor and is very soluble in water. Index is the percentage strength of concentrated embalming fluid 
and refers to the amount of absolute formaldehyde gas by volume present. It refers to the gas, not formalin. Index is represented by how many grams of gas are contained in 100 milliliters of fluid. Formaldehyde acts quickly on a particular area. It may not penetrate to remote tissues, hence it was a pretty bad preservative without something to assist it with penetration. Um, aqueous solution containing 37% formaldehyde gas by mass in water or water and methyl alcohol is formalin. Okay, An aqueous solution containing 37% formaldehyde gas by mass in water or water and methyl alcohol. Now the solution is slightly more dense than water. Okay and corresponds to a solution that is 40% formaldehyde by volume. I'm not going to get into the craziness behind those numbers, but these are extremely important numbers to memorize. Note card it, write it down, and learn it. Formalin, aqueous solution containing 37% formaldehyde gas by mass. Okay? By mass, so the weight of something. Okay, the weight of something in water or water and alcohol. Solution is slightly more dense, so it takes up more space and corresponds to a 40% by overall volume. The 37% by mass, 40% by volume is the standard commercial product. The precipitate or solid of formalin is paraformaldehyde, which can drop out of the solution and cause a non-uniformity in the strength of solution if it's not mixed up, which is why if you see powdery stuff at the bottom of your arterial fluid, you need to shake it up and get the flavor all throughout it again, or else you're going to have some problems with your injection solution. So what sucks about it? All this stuff sucks about formaldehyde. It rapidly coagulates blood. You know, there's a lot of protein in blood. So as soon as it hits it, it starts to react on it. Converts tissues to gray because it reacts with the heme in the, in the, um, in the blood. Locks down discolorations. If it's there and formaldehyde gets to it, it's going to lock it and it ain't going to go nowhere. So you're going to have to bleach it. Dehydrates, constricts capillaries, deteriorates over time, oxidizes to form an acid, which we don't need an acidic environment in the body. Can be decomposed to an alcohol, has an unpleasant odor, irritates the hell out of an embalmer, is a possible carcinogen. What are the advantages to it? Well, it's 100% organic. It's a naturally occurring substance. It breaks down to, you know, carbon-based stuff. Breaks down quickly in sunlight or bacteria, nitrogen, and soil. So it's actually, once it breaks down, it's somewhat beneficial. Inexpensive, bactericidal, kills the critters. Well, because critters are made of protein, and this messes with protein. Inhibits growth of molds. So it's not a mold preventative. It just inhibits it. Rapidly destroys autolytic enzymes, because enzymes are proteins. Rapidly acts on body proteins to preserve quickly so decomposition doesn't occur. Only a small amount needed to preserve a large amount of protein. There's a whole section on embalming mass that we'll get to at some point. Deodorizes body amines formed during putrefaction. So paraformaldehyde, the polymer of formaldehyde, it's white and powdery. It's a solid, okay? It's a solid. Remember, it's formalin. Formalin is the solid form. Um... Contains 85 to 99% formaldehyde, so pretty potent stuff. Generally formed from evaporation or distillation. Okay. Used in hardening compounds or preservative powder. So this is an accessory chemical. Trioxane, a polymer of formaldehyde. Colorless crystalline material. Smells like chloroform. So this would be something handy to take on your first date, right? No. Do not take this on dates. Do not take chloroform on your dates. That just weirds me out. Costly to produce compared to other forms. Hence, people don't want to play with expensive stuff. Other aldehydes. It gives you all these different aldehydes. Um, condensation products are formaldehyde donors. Okay? Aliphatic nitrohydroxy compounds formed as a result of a condensation reaction between nitroparaffins and certain aldehydes. So that would be an important definition of formaldehyde donor or condensation product. 
used to create low odor or fumeless products. So that's the selling point. Low odor or fumeless product. Materials have a slow fixation rate, which means they're going to penetrate probably fairly well. But there's the kicker. Very expensive to produce. Dialdehydes are two aldehyde functional groups in the same molecule. And the most common dialdehyde is glyoxyl, a 30% yellow aqueous solution containing small amounts of ethylene glycol, glycolic acid, formic acid, and formaldehyde tends to stain a tissue yellow, used only in cavity fluid formations because we do not need staining anything yellow. Its optimal pH range is 9 to 10, which means since our body pretty much, you know, on its worst days in decomposition goes down to a 5.5 and then gets back up into the 7s, this is not good for preservative value, but probably ideal for something else, hence cavity. It is a liquid at room temperature. Glutaraldehyde, stable, 2.5% aqueous solution with mild odor and light color. Not permitted in Europe and Great Britain. Capable of reacting over a wide pH range unlike many aldehydes. It's a liquid at room temperature. Changes nature of protein, making them unsuitable for bacteria. Removes less moisture than formaldehyde. And is much better as a disinfecting agent than a preservative. You say, well, Professor Finn, this looks like an ideal way to go. Um, in comparison to using, you know, a formalin solution. Well, yeah, it's also expensive. Uh, so another reason why they don't use it. Carbolic acid, phenol. It's a preservative and germicide, one of the most common chemicals in early embalming fluids because it's a coal tar derivative, and coal was used extensively in the 1800s for a variety of reasons. Primarily used in cavity fluids today or as a or an accessory chemical uh, bleaching agent. Phenol is a crystalline, colorless solid. Color changes in strong light or metallic combination, but it does not affect potency. So just because the color changes does not mean it's gotten any less effective. Penetrates skin readily and rapidly absorbed by proteins. Tends to produce putty gray tissue. That would be bad. Um, can be used as a mold inhibitor or bleaching agent, which is primarily what we use it for these days. Very corrosive to living tissue. You don't want to get this on you. And many are not water soluble, so it doesn't play well with water and does not firm as well as formaldehyde. And essentially, it's because it burns the protein. It actually basically burns it. So bacteria can't eat the burnt stuff. A triple base fluid usually contains phenol, methyl alcohol, and formaldehyde. A double base contains at least methyl alcohol and formaldehyde. Uh, your book says it can also be formaldehyde and phenol, phenol and methyl alcohol. So basically, uh, the three big guys here, methyl alcohol, formaldehyde, and phenol, triple base, all of them. Double base, any two of the three. Salts. Various salts have been used for preservative purposes over the years. Common salts that we use today are potassium acetate, sodium nitrate, and salts of aluminum. Heavy metal salts are not used because they're toxic as hell. So how do these things work? And I've alluded to this uh, before. So in formaldehyde, the way formaldehyde preserves is uh, it takes the proteins, which are coiled and folded in order to perform a specific function. So that's your DNA, essentially, right? Um, embalming rips it apart. It okay, rips it apart and links with it, making it incapable of breaking down. Uh, the disinfection is done by the same mechanism as most enzymes and bacteria proteins in nature. So when it rips them apart and reforms them into something new, it effectively kills those things. Phenol does not preserve by this cross-linking at all. It gets inside the cytoplasm, becomes acidic, starts burning stuff up. Alcohols also do not cross-link. Okay? They get inside the cells and take the water out. Water is necessary for decomposition. So if you remove the water, it doesn't decompose. It prohibits cell metabolism. Salts preserved by desiccation. They do not produce viewable results. It takes the moisture out and turns you into jerky. So germicides. Germicides. One of the purposes of embalming is the sanitizing of the tissues of the body. Germicides are built into just about everything we use. Okay? They kill or render incapable the reproduction of disease causing microorganisms. That's an important definition. Most preservatives act as germicides. 
So they do double duty. Quats or quaternary ammonium compounds and glutaraldehyde are very good germicides. Quats are germicides and deodorizers. They are not compatible with wetting agents and arterial fluids. They also don't play well with dyes, so they're typically restricted to cavity fluids, cold sterilization liquids for your instruments, mold inhibitors, or deodorant spray. So we've seen modifying agents. I've alluded to them. I've talked about them. Well, a modifying agent controls the rate of the main preservative chemical. Okay. If we don't want it to firm quick, we put something in it, a modifying agent, to reduce it or speed it up even further. Buffers, humectants, water conditioners, inorganic salts usually control the rate of chemical action. And many chemicals will multitask and appear under different headings. So buffers, they stabilize the acid-base balance of the fluid and also the tissues where the fluid reacts with cellular proteins. EDTA, borate, carbonate, phosphate, anything with basically an ATE is a buffer. Sorax, okay, you buy it at the store, is a stabilizing agent, it is a buffer. Carbonates, sodium carbonate or magnesium carbonate, they're not as good as a borate. So the borate are the best buffers. Humectants or plasticizing agents, they have a coating action. They wrap around the formaldehyde molecule and thus keep the formaldehyde from making direct contact until the tissues are thoroughly saturated and then gradually release it over time. Makes tissues more flexible and rubbery. Generally, a humectant will adhere to a cell. So it's a large molecule. We have our cell right here, and our cell has pores by which stuff get inside the cell. Fluid molecules, very small, will generally be able to go right inside through the pores, and it's no issue. However, humectant chemicals will adhere to the outside of the cell and prevent stuff from getting in. Um, and this allows things to get in gradually. So as they fall off, as they do whatever, the preservative reaction is controlled. So that's how a humectant works. Examples of humectants. Glycerin. Okay, glycerin is a humectant. can be classified as an alcohol. Produced synthetically from petroleum products, increases germ-killing power of other chemicals, has an affinity for moisture. Sorbitol, glycol, used more extensively today than glycerin. Loses water at a slower rate. That's probably why, because you want a humectant to hold water in. At low temperatures, it can precipitate. So if it gets cold, it will separate from solution. Ethylene glycol, readily soluble and has a moisture retainer, colorless and odorless. Propylene glycol, superior to glycerin as a general solvent. It's a mold inhibitor. It's also colorless and odorless, like its little cousin, ethylene glycol. Polyhydroxyl alcohols, um, cosmetic oils, so lanolin and silicon, okay, are cosmetic oils. They're not water soluble, may be dispersed in smaller fractions or in derivatives, and they help reduce the drying effect. Humectant, that's its job. Gums are humectants, restores moisture to tissues. Trapped in capillary beds due to size of molecule. Um, so you can see that a lot of the stuff works by adhering and preventing stuff from getting in or getting out. Uh, used prior to removal of blood may cause complications. Well, yeah, because it's going to stick with all sorts of stuff. And some examples of gums are caria and trigacanth. Inorganic salts, they can serve as buffers, anticoagulants, preservatives, germicides, and water conditioners. Easily dissolved. Salts, you know, dissolve typically easily in a vehicle. And they control the osmotic quality of a fluid. High concentration, low concentration, and the fluid's um, ability to go, you know, back and forth. Anticoags. Used to maintain blood in a liquid state. Make it easy to remove from the circulatory system. Inhibits or stop the clotting ability. Usually does not liquefy a pre-existing clot. So anticoagulants do not destroy clots. They don't play with them at all. Must be chemically compatible with everything else in the solution or inert to them. So it cannot play with anything in there. Water softeners or conditioners. The, group group, uh, the book groups them together with anticoags because of similarities, but I wish to differentiate between the two. The same things do the same things. Um, improve drainage by keeping blood in a liquid state. Reduces hardness of water to allow better penetration. So buffers, for instance, um, also do this as well. Okay, reduce hardness of water. So it'll have water softener built into a buffer maybe. Dyes produce better results in an alkaline situation, which is promoted by a water softener or buffer. 
Uh, aldehydes and other fixatives typically work better in a slightly alkaline environment. So that would be some important information you get. So anticoags and softeners, there's a list of um, anticoags and softeners. Surfactants, lighting agents, one of the greatest developments that has occurred in embalming is the removing of body liquids by lowering their surface tension. You break down the particles, the particles leave. Okay. So capillary attraction, force that attracts and holds liquid in the capillary tubes is the result of surface tension. Okay. If the surface tension is lowered, it flows easily out. So, for instance, water and oil mixture surfactant destroys the surface tension of the component. So instead of balling up and beating, the oil disperses much quicker, much quicker without you know you having to sit there and agitate it. So three reasons for use: lowered surface tension um, allows the embalming solution to flow more readily and rapidly through the capillaries, causing better penetration. Almost immediately clears blood from the capillaries as a result of this, and it's easier to incorporate coloring agents. The addition of surfactants in proper concentrations produces better pen penetration of preservative in a more uniform manner. Surface tension rises with variations in temperature. As temperature rises, tension reduces. As temperature um, rises, especially in water, fluid will fixate quickly. So the warmer the water, the faster the reaction, which is why we tend not to use warm water unless we have to. Um, it also increases the germicidal action of chemical solutions. They function best in low concentrations. Obviously have to play well with the preservative and everything else in there, dyes, etc. Excessive use may result in excessive drainage and oversaturation of preservative. So you've blown too much water out and you've put too much preservative in, which means it's going to dehydrate even quicker. So you have to be careful with it. You have three categories of surfactants. Anionic, okay? It gives you examples of the anionics. Not compatible with other anionic and non-ionic agents. Cationic. Those are your quaternary ammonium compounds, your quats. They are inactivated by anionic compounds such as soap. So that's why you don't want them playing together. In non-ionic, they do not ionize ethylene oxide condensation products with amides and fatty acids. So coloring agents, dyes, used for the purpose of producing an internal cosmetic effect that closely simulates the natural coloring of tissues. Two types of dye used depends on pH of arterial fluid. Okay? We have active and inactive dyes. So active dyes, color tissues, usually a blend of dyes. Um, generally, they are coal tar derivatives. Red dyes are blended to restore natural color to tissues. An example of these dyes are as follows, and you see them there. Natural coloring agents, okay? You would need to know what these natural agents are and what they form from, that would be important. And the natural agents are generally not used in modern solutions. They react because they, you know, um, come from nature, plant-based and whatnot, so they have protein. They generally react with the stuff that we don't want to react with, uh, the formalin. This would be perfect, however, in something different like a green or an environmentally friendly non-formalin-based preservative where the preservative is not going to react with a dye. The synthetics are much more compatible with other substances in the fluids, hence we use them, the coal tar derivatives, economical, permanent, the naturals fade over time, etc. Uh, other issues with them, and it gives you a breakdown of what they are, what the color of the powder or what color they um, form into. That would be important, okay? So all of these dyes, um, for the most part, are going to give your body the color it lost at some point in time in life, okay? And knowing which ones work best for what skins are important. You also have biological stains, okay? You have biological stains. Um, must be stable in formaldehyde, water soluble in part of natural flesh colored tissues. Again, these are cold hard dyes. Um, perfuming materials, deodorants, masking agents, these would be important as well. Uh, selected for the ability to cover harsh chemicals, but also for pleasant odor. Wisteria rose, lilac, essential oils, aromatic esters, 
Uh, if the fluid does not have a high concentration of formaldehyde or other irritating chemical, you can use synthetic compounds that mimic spices, fruits, and other aromas. Sassafras, methyl salicylate, or oil of wintergreen is one of the more popular ones. Vehicles, carriers, or solvents. Uh, all preservatives and compounds must be dissolved in a solvent. The solvent must be compatible with all the other compounds. So we have water, glycerin, sorbitol, glycol, alcohol as our main vehicles, the stuff that we put in the bottle. And obviously some of these things can do some double duty. So alcohol serves as a vehicle by which to inject it. Okay? It also stabilizes the formaldehyde so it doesn't break out of the solution and form a precipitate. So folks, thank you for paying attention, and we will see you next time.